morning and welcome to worship. I am Julie Johnson, moderator of Pilgrim Congregational Church UCC in Duluth, Minnesota. Today's sermon will be given by Lee Stewart, executive director of CHUM in Duluth. Lee has served in this position since 2013. Her biography mentions that she is a community organizer, social change agent, agitator for justice, and a highly skilled administrator of nonprofit organizations, all true. We look forward to Lee's words of inspiration. Let us worship together. The voice of God spoke over the waters. And the voice of God said, let there be, and there was. The voice of God said, let there be pilgrims who wish to be baptized. And there were. And it was good. The voice of God came from heaven. And the voice of God said, You are my daughter, the beloved. You are my son, the beloved. With, With you, you I am, am well pleased. pleased. In the washing of the baptismal waters, we became light, light to the world. And God saw that the light was good. God, who spoke words of love for Jesus at his baptism, and who yet speaks words of love for us at the font, be present. Speak to us anew this day that we may speak boldly of you in a world that desperately longs to be recreated in your love. Amen. I'd like to share the confession with you coming from Psalm 29. The voice of God is powerful. The God of glory thunders. The voice of God flashes forth flames of fire. Before this God, we humbly bow and confess that we have not lived in the freedom of our baptism. We have not loved God as God loves us. We have not loved our neighbors as we are bidden. As you ordered the chaos of creation, so order the chaos of our lives. Speak to us tender words of love and forgiveness. Amen. And with the assurance of grace, we read God speaks again and again words of love and forgiveness. You are my son, my daughter, my beloved ones. With you, I am well pleased. Hear these words and go in peace. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. all of you to join Tris and me in the passing of the peace and what I would like you to do today is to imagine two or three 
friends or folks you have met at Pilgrim when we did gather together and imagine them in your mind as we pass the peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Genesis includes creation stories drawn from two different sources. The authors of the first creation story emphasize the goodness of God's creation and how God created the orderly world out of chaos and gave humans a place of honor. Listen for the word in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. <clears throat> then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. In the first verses of this gospel lesson for today, Mark quotes an Old Testament passage prophesizing that God will send a messenger to prepare the way for Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ begins with John's call for repentance. Listen now to the words in the gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem 
were going out to him. And there they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you in the water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And thus, he was coming up out of the water. He saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice from heaven called out, you are my son, the beloved, and you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Good morning and thank you Pastor Judith and members of the Pilgrim community for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm here to share something extraordinary that has come from COVID. It really has felt like the Holy Spirit coming over us and I would go so far as to refer to a new baptism. Processes and situations that were and remain problematic were transformed through the action of the Spirit. It's unlike anything I've ever witnessed. When COVID hit last February, I looked to the CHUM mission where I start everything, which is to provide basic necessities, foster stable lives, and organize for a just and compassionate community. We do that day in and day out at CHUM, and as you know, we also strive to fulfill the scriptures from Matthew, which are foundational to us. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, visit people in prison. That was and remains our ground of being, and so when COVID hit, I thought, well, carry on, double down. But what actually happened blew my mind. For the first time in my professional life, the last shall be first is our direct experience at CHUM. Long ago at South Bronx churches, I remember my first exposure to people who actually believed and acted as if they were living inside scriptures today. Not that the scripture stories happened sometime long ago or were metaphors for today, but they were something that was going on right now, that we're part of salvation history and that we, need, we have a role to play. And maybe that's a normal progression as one matures in faith, but I do remember sitting in the basement of Our Lady of Victory Catholic Church just with my mind exploding at the potential if we could actually bring the, that spirit, that witness, that feeling of the miracles occurring th that we read about, if we could bring that to present day, how great it would be. Even, and it's always a surprise, and it, even though it's promised, I will send you an advocate. And I, and I remember during this time I thought of a, a sign I had seen in St. Lucy's Church in Syracuse, New York, when I just happened to stop by. It was a big sign. It was painted in, on red letters on a white sheet, and it said, the Holy Spirit is here, and she is wild. And the story of Chum <laughs> during COVID really has been a wild Holy Spirit. So most of you know my background as a scientist, and I approach things like that. I do experiments. I evaluate. I look at data. I'm a geek about that. And so when uh, I first heard the words of, of COVID coming, I thought, well, I know about that. Uh, we need to get ready for that. And I just say, as a scientist, I, wrote, I calculated my first r naught equations in 1972. So I had a pretty good idea about what viral expansion could be and what might, what might happen. So HUD had sent out a little notice, that, three little documents about how to control infectious disease in shelters. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a pretty good thing to read. I should read those things. And so one was for shelters, one for was encampments, and one was just homelessness in general. And every single one of them said, the first step one is to go connect with your public health official. So I called up Amy Westbrook, who is the totally awesome director of St. Louis County Public Health. And I said, so Amy, step one in HUD's instructions to shelter operators is connect with your public health official. So now where do we go from here? And within a day, Amy had created a five-person task force just for CHUM to figure out how do we deal with, what's the best way for us to deal with COVID. That task force had people who were experts in public health, mental health, risk safety, housing, and contracts. Amy knew right away it was gonna to get to money at some point, so she wanted the contract knowledge with us from day one. 
So starting in the beginning of March, we began to lay pla plans for what was going to happen if there were a rapid outbreak in the homeless community. If you remember, that was one of the predictions, that communities like homeless shelters, congregate settings were going to be the, the, the flashpoint for uh, COVID back last spring. It turned out not to happen that way, but we were still prepared that it might. So on March 25th, with the governor's first order, we started immediately. And the reaction and the help to CHUM started immediately. That very afternoon, the first call I got was from the Charleston Foundation in the Twin Cities with an offer of a $10,000 grant to help us harden the Steve O'Neill early ch childhood programs in the face of COVID. Uh, I think we're the only organization, one of the few organizations outside the Twin Cities that they fund. Then came a call from the Ordean Foundation with $30,000 to help us do what we needed to do in the shelter for Medica with $50,000 and a little bit later from the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. So within 48 hours, we had $90,000 of unexpected foundation institutional support so that we could do the th what we needed to do, get with the PPE, make sure we had the sanitizing equipment, start working on physical barriers in the shelter. What, and, and then what, whatever we needed just came when, within minutes of us announcing that we weren't going to be able to do the rhubarb festival, we got a totally anonymous, and I mean totally anonymous, individual gift of $70,000 to repay the revenue that we normally get from that event. I, this way I say I was blown away. So I don't know what other states did, but Minnesota right away a, a bipartisan legislative action created a fund for making sure that the homeless community in Minnesota was protected against COVID, $26 million, and sent out a request for proposals to, to how we would spend that money. And it wasn't at all like the, the normal our request for proposals from the state runs about 100 pages. It requires a long, 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 long process. This was not that. It was a two-page explanation. You guys need help with staffing, health and hygiene, uh, and shelter expansion services, let us know what you need. So the county uh, applied for money to, to rent the Radisson Annex, which is 72 rooms, so that if we had an outbreak at CHUM, we could follow the instructions and move the entire shelter into isolation and quarantine at, at, at once. Uh, CHUM applied for funding 24-7 to staff that if that happened. I put another little Google form out on the, on the website to find people who would do that, and the most extraordinary group of people showed up. Some were people who had recently lost their jobs, some were people who had been at CHUM or used our services, some were people from HDC who wanted to help out, some were pharmacy students from the University of Minnesota who had known about CHUM through, through uh, their work at Hope Clinic. So it was almost overnight we had a tremendous staff and we've maintained that staff. You know, again, in those days, March, we thought it was going to last till April, May, but it's, it's carrying on now almost a year and uh, we, have, you know, we still have those folks who are working with us. Another thing that HUD recommended is that we look at our, our population and within CHOM, which was already in the shelter, already a vulnerable population, to see if we could isolate some of the most vulnerable people, the people who were elderly, who had underlying health conditions. And this is where the city stepped in. We found about 20 people who were like that, who would meet those criteria. So the city, th using the same funding from the state of Minnesota, uh, rented the first floor of the downtown Duluth Inn, which is just kitty corner to, to CHUM, so that we could give those extremely vulnerable people a private place to isolate and to make sure that they were safe. It's really difficult to have a, a st you know, stay at home and self-isolate if you don't have a home, and so this was our effort to make sure that the most vulnerable among us were able to do that. So this whole process made me think of the game called Prisoner's Dilemma, because we had this huge pot of money, $26 million. They asked us to uh, recommended and gently asked that we apply for that in 30-day tranches, uh, but we weren't required to do that. And so for a moment, I, for a few months, I thought, well, I don't know, that, you know, sounds like a lot of money to me, but I don't know what all is necessary across the state. Should I just go all in for CHUM and say, to heck with the 30-day thing, should I just go in for uh, six months, take a hog as much as I could, or should I go along with the 30-day the request? So. Also, those of you who know me know that I am, prob I am always the collaborator in Prisoner's Dilemma. I am never the selfish person in Prisoner's Dilemma. It sometimes costs me. But I said, OK, I'm just going to go in. And to my complete astonishment, and this is testimony to Minnesota, every single homeless organization, every single county, every single city, no one hogged their resources. Everybody cooperated. The entire state decided to share. And so that initial track, track went from March all the way through September.
Month after month, we were all able to apply and keep, keep receiving the funds we needed to take the extra steps to keep ourselves safe from COVID. Then as that was running out, they put another $22 million in, and that got us through the end of the year and now into January and February. So my favorite story during this time was like how the spirit was moving. Uh, I woke up one night and I thought, wow, Damiano is going to be closed, and that is our main community kitchen. So where are people who are homeless going to eat? We serve a couple meals at Chum, but not all meals. So I called up the state and I said, hey, uh, is adding a food service to our shelter, does that count as an sh expansion of shelter services? And they said yes. So the next thing I did was I emailed and called up Tom Hansen at the Duluth Grill and I said, well, is it possible for you all to give us a menu at half your regular price point? Because if so, I will apply for funding and we will be able to uh, you know, have, have a great time. So his team put together a magnificent uh, menu that was at about $7 a meal. Uh, uh, and with the help from the state, we were able from May through December to offer three meals a day from the Duluth Grill to the homeless, sh to the shelter, homeless shelter at Chum. For up through July, we were the only place where someone experiencing homelessness in Duluth could get a hot meal. And it was great for Duluth Grill too because it gave them a, lot, a business line that they had feared they would lose. The people, the people, it kept them employed. It kept the people there were very happy to be helpful. It was just a, a really great uh, cooperation uh, to to meet a basic need. So after that, the city, the, after the state weighed in, then the city and the county also weighed in with their CARES money. And again, all the normal things about requests for proposals just went onto the simple mode. So with the CARES Act from the city, we received about $200,000 to keep renting the Duluth in uh, through March, maybe through June. Uh, we got $95,000 to remodel downstairs our bathrooms and our kitchen so it's easier to sanitize and uh, better just basically upgraded facilities for people who stay with us. $37,000 to double the size of our food shelf freezer and $50,000 to support the family programs at Steve O'Neill. Then we got a couple uh, $20,000 to hang curtains in between our bunk beds to help as a physical barrier for transmission. And I wrote a proposal that Damiano submitted that you've probably seen on the news lately to get uh, six stall showers and toilets so that we now have a, a general hygiene, public hygiene facility for people experiencing homelessness. And the outpouring of this kind of support, it continues. Just this last two weeks, whenever there's a little bit of vaccine left over from what the public health department is doing, they call places like CHUM and say, can you send people over for vaccinations? And so far we've been able to vaccinate about a third of our staff. Uh, now the Department of Health is moving us up on the, on the line to be, not have to wait to the end of the vials. But I just think it was really terrific that when, when there was excess, who they thought about was the frontline workers at, at, at CHUM and the, Chum, and the Chum, um, CHUM people who were staying there. So it really is a miracle that we were able to keep COVID at bay so long, uh, through mid-November actually at CHUM. Prior to mid-November, we'd only had about 50 people who had come into our isolation quarantine facility at the, uh, at the Radisson, but only five of them were from CHUM and none of them were positive. Uh, one of the things that we didn't expect, well, when, we, when Amy and I set up that whole system, we thought it was basically going to be for the CHUM population, but it turned out that we were covering the entire southern St. Louis County, people who were experiencing homelessness, people who were doubled up, uh, and in fact, um, there were a number of circumstances where people were released from corrections with positive who became homeless in Duluth or came here for medical care and instead of going back to Virginia where they had a home would be released in Duluth pending at their next treatment and then they would become homeless and then they would become part of part of Chum's responsibility. So no kidding, we've had we took over the course of the from you know March until November, we had referrals from seven other nonprofit organizations who didn't have a COVID plan except that send them to Chum. And that, that felt just a little bit abusive, but we said, yes, we're ready, we did it, you know, that's who we are, that's how we roll. Uh, and I've, but I've, I've spent, I have begun to draw more barriers with, or boundaries with my colleagues to say, at this point in the pandemic, your COVID plans cannot include the word chum. You know, we have enough. Um, so really, we're the only ones who, I can count on not saying no, but really in this whole experience, the city has not said no, the county has not said no, the state has not said no. Uh, and it, it, that's why I say it feels like a new baptism and a new movement of spirit. 
So what's going on now at CHUM is in mid-November, a couple of staff tested positive, and we had our first positive case in CHUM shelter. I happened to be on a four-day hiking trip in the Porcupine Mountains when this was going on, so I was totally oblivious to it. I came back and discovered that we had hit the threshold for a mass testing. And part of our policy is if anybody, if anybody on staff was positive, then we needed to be tested too. So I ran off and spit in a tube, and a couple of days later, I came back positive too. And so uh, this was just as we were moving the entire shelter into the Radisson, just as we were setting up the mass testing experiences. It tested my control freak personality a lot, uh, not to be able to be involved in that. But as I said, I had a really light case and was working that on, on remote control. What was really interesting is with the point prevalence survey, which is the other word for mass testing, we had started working in July. If you, if you remember, at first the peak was supposed to be in April. And then in St. Louis County, they moved it to July. So when that prediction happened, St. Luke's and I began, began working on how can we do a mass testing best at CHUM. And so we created this plan in July. We didn't need to roll it out until mid-November, but we did. We moved everyone into the Radisson. There was a St. Luke's team there who were able to do the testing and making the swabs. And it, was, it wasn't easy, uh, but uh, basically it was great that we were rolling out a plan that we had plan that we had rather than trying to create. Now what do we do? So at that, at those testing, we tested 65 people in the first time. Some people refused tests. And of those 65, only three came back positive. They were all asympto asymptomatic. None of them had been in the room with our direct, our first exposure or positive. So uh, we felt that we had contained it. We tested again everyone and had no, no positives. So in that first outbreak, which we were been so worried about, because of planning and cooperation, we were able to contain that uh, outbreak in the shelter. We closed the shelter for three days, did deep, deep cleaning and sanitizing, so we would be ready when the people who had had two negatives could come back into shelter or anyone new to town would have a place to stay. But since then, we've had pretty much a steady stream, not so much from CHUM, but again from the hospitals, from detox, from other places, other parts of the homeless community, people who are doubled up, uh, who can't go back to their, their place where they're sleeping, they're couch surfing because of fear of, of transmission. So we have about 11 people now over at the Radisson. We've had two more mass testings at CHUM. The first one came back 11% positive, or the second 5% positive. Uh, that sounds pretty grim to me, but the Department of Health says, no, 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 no. Usually what we, we would have expected, if this had been a shelter in the cities, we would have expected a positive return rate on those tests of 30%. So they're really complementary on the way CHUM has been able to, with physical barriers, through sanitizing, through mask enforcement, through, I'd say, good nutrition, uh, and, and screening and rapid ability to move people into isolation and quarantine, they think that we've done a really good job on that. So what I really want you to know at Pilgrim today is that every level, this has been the last becoming first. Again, never in my life have I experienced that. I've always felt like I've had to scrabble and scramble and get people to pay attention to the most vulnerable and the poorest of the poor. That has not been the experience now. There has been no expense, no obstacle, no nothing that has caused a glitch in our response. And it's astonishing. So, but I do want to acknowledge that uh, it couldn't have been so if CHUM weren't in the mix. The reputation of CHUM, our integrity, the way we build partnerships and relational power rather than factions, all of this work over the last 45 years, some of which you've been involved in all, 40 of, all, all 45 years of that, has culminated in us being able to respond that way. And not just to respond, but to initiate the response and the cooperation that's required. So really thank you, Pilgrim, because for your support, your leadership, your example of standing up for those who have no voice, who have no money, who have no family or place to live, CHUM operates in your space, your fa and, and so as sure, sure as CHUM has been doing this work, you have been doing this work. So please share this good news. I'm not minimizing the severity of what's going on. We're a long way from done yet. Uh, but you can count on CHUM to stay true, to keep responding, to take every step we can to build our capacity for response, for shelter, for food, for hygiene, for health, anything that we can to put the needs of people experiencing homelessness first. We can't do it without you, and you need to know we're doing it in your name. So each and every day at CHUM, we're doubled down, we're carrying on. We will meet every challenge that comes, and it comes, they come every day. Uh, we muster the courage and grace we can, and although we stumble a bit, we're still really walking that road. So in the midst of pretty, you know, I would say unsettling, terrifying, 
uh, political and social unrest and COVID uh, uh, and uncertainties, I want you to have this little bright spot in your heart here that uh, this example of the response of, this, of the entire community, public, private, and nonprofit sectors, and you all as congregation of CHUM to meet the needs of the uh, home, people experiencing homelessness here has been really astonishing. It's been faith in action, and please share the joy. Uh, we really have lived to witness a new, to new form of cooperation, a new form of grace, a new form of power. So as soon as I say that, I always hear this at the back of my head. I said, you know, it won't last. It isn't perfect. You know, you're kind of roughing up, you know, you're smoothing over some really rough spots. There are still obstacles. Normal systems of oppression will return. People will die. Just wait for that. You know, what happens when the state has a budget of billions of dollars? What's going to happen then? And so I say to that voice in my head, get thee behind me, Satan. Because for me, uh, Psalm 29, the Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. That's been true in, in this COVID. And, and so in Psalm 27, verse 13, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We have seen that at Chum and throughout Duluth. And then for these reasons I proclaim, the Lord has done great things for us and holy is his name. Today I would like to share the benediction twice with you, and I would like to first read it as the prayer, prayers of the people. Go out into the world in peace and in Christ's name. As each of us return to our day in Duluth and other communities, I want you to put the shoe on the other foot, so to speak. Sometimes as we pray for the poor, the weak, and those who need clothing, 
we don't always imagine and pray for the gifts that these people bring to others. Join me in being mindful of the humble who make others proud, the poor who have riches to share, the weak who help others be strong, the care receivers who overflow with loving kindness to their caregivers. I pray that the largest of the love of God and the treasure of the grace of Christ and the buoyant health of the Holy Spirit be with all of you today and this coming week. I pray this prayer that it will be with you on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and next Sunday when we meet again here on YouTube at the same time. Amen. Please join us in prayer. Our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will be done on earth, on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Ephesian disciples received the gift of the Spirit and were so gifted for ministry in the world. In baptism, we are so gifted, and in turn, we offer the gifts of our labor for the good of God's creation. God of glory, in baptism, we dedicate our lives to you and pledge to become your voice of love in the world. Hold us close in our baptismal vows as we bring ourselves, our time, and our possessions to you that they may be gifts of your love in a world in which your tender voice of love is often drowned out by voices of violence, hatred, and oppression. Use us and all we have to your glory. Amen. Hear these words as you go out into the world this coming week. Go out into the world in peace and in Christ's name. Be as each of you return to 
your day in Duluth and other communities that you might be living in, I would like you to put the shoe on the other foot, so to speak. Sometimes as we pray for the poor, the weak, and those who need clothing, we don't always imagine and pray for the gifts that they bring to others, and in doing so, to pray for their strength. Join me in being mindful of the humble who make others proud, the poor who have riches to share, the weak who help others be strong, the care receivers who overflow with loving kindness to their caregivers. I pray that the largest of the love of God and the treasure of the grace of Christ Jesus and the buoyant health of the Holy Spirit will be with you today. And this coming week, I pray this benediction will be with you on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then next Sunday as we meet here again. In thy holy name we pray, amen. Thank you.